Hey, we're live. Richard, you're there with me. All right, everyone. Good to see you. Can everyone hear me? Let's just make sure everyone can hear me first. I hear you. Uh, you hear me. Excellent. Uh, Isabella from Vienna. I wish I was in Vienna right now. Stefano yeah, from Italy. Whoa, look, at all, look at all the Italians. Giandrea. Oh, boy. Boy, oh, boy. Look at all the Italian connection. I need to start learning to speak Italian. That's what I need to do. That's, just, that's easy. You just um, speak sort of Spanish with an A or an A, uh, an o on the end. Oh, is that all there is to it? Oh, <laughs> if only I had known that. Oh, <laughs> Good Andre from the Netherlands. Excellent. Def Def Stanislav Stefano. All right. Great. Actually, great, people great. say that Catalan and Italian are very similar. They do, yeah. Yeah, my Catalan friends always say when they go to Italy and they read a menu, it's almost exactly Catalan, except sometimes there's an extra letter here and there, but it's practically the same thing. So that's pretty cool. <laughs> There's Antoine. <laughs> you realize we, we've just insulted two, two whole nations. <laughs> I don't think we've insulted them. We've <laughs> talked about their incredible similarities. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, cultural exchange here. Yeah. So as you can see, uh, today we've kind of swapped roles. Uh, Richard's off in Dubai, and I'm in Richard's office. So here's my best, <clears throat> here's my best Richard impression. I, I grew up in Canada, so I'm going to try to pretend I'm from the UK. Hello, Governor. <laughs> <laughs> my name's Richard the Razor Hodges. <laughs> right, that's, that's all I got. That's, that's as good as it gets. Richard the Razor. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> is it is that called the Cockney accent? Is that what, is that what that is? Well, the, the, yeah, the Cockneys are from um, the east, east end of London. Okay, and so you've got that sort of archetypal um, accent <laughs> that was butchered on Mary Poppins by um, what's his name? Oh yes, uh, uh, I'll think of his name in a little while. Uh, Dick Van Dyke. Dick Van Dyke. Yeah, yeah. that was the, you, I mean, that was the most god awful Cockney accent in, on, yeah. in the universe. But. Did you know he's still alive? He's, he's really quite an interesting chap, Dick Van Dyke. Uh, Anyways, enough, enough of that. All right, so uh, let's jump on. Everyone can hear me. We've got uh, lots, of, lots of people with us today. Good to see you. Let me just set some things up here. I'm going to uh, – well, first off, no, let me take a look at my – let's take a look at the charts first. Then uh, what we're going to do is uh, we'll look at the poll. Okay, we've got a poll question regarding last week's trade. And then we'll uh, start to talk about the topic uh, of this week. So without further ado, quickly, let me just, excuse me, jump over to my silly charts. Interesting. Interesting. So here we're looking at Bitcoin. And, you know, last week I drew this little, I put this little line here. I talked and we, we were pushing up, if, if you recall. And um, I said, hey, I don't expect it to go through that line. If it does, it's going to hit some resistance. I don't expect it just to fly through, maybe wick through and come back. I expected it to pull back, and it did. Every now and then, you know, I'm right. It's kind of hit a range, but we can see that it's still kind of strong. You know, we're still on an uptrend, right? And if, if we were a technical person, we'd be like, okay, well, we've still got this uptrend, right? Well, we do. So, you know, there's no reason to think this might not continue up. And actually, just before the call, when Richard and I were chatting, I think, Richard, you're, the term you used was you're starting to feel the beginnings of strength starting to build in Bitcoin. And is this, uh, you know, people's attitudes uh, going forward into the having kind of position themselves just in case that there is a big run up? I don't know. But when we come over and we look at Ethereum, it had a run up too. But I mean, we pulled back <laughs> directly like smack dab in the middle of that former channel. And I honestly, I don't expect that to change very much. I wouldn't be surprised if it came down to the bottom of the channel. I wouldn't be surprised if it popped up to the top either. But I don't expect any big moves in ETH. Now, if Bitcoin leads the charge and goes on a tear straight up, sure, it's going to drag Ethereum up with it. I'd expect resistance in some of these areas up here. But right now, uh, you know, I'm not doing very much. Uh, I'm just selling short dated stuff. I'm kind of sitting on it. As we get, I've got a lot of stuff expiring tomorrow, uh, Friday on, on the 6th of October expiry. When that's all gone, I'm probably going to be inclined to sell another iron condor. I'll probably do it on the 20th or the 27th. Uh, it, not very far out. I'm going to keep it within two, three, four weeks, I think, um, just because I'm a bit wary of what Bitcoin might do. 
uh, and wary, not not worried, just you know, cognizant of it, and I want to take advantage of it. Right now, I, I must admit, I am a little bit short delta in ETH in my own position, so I am kind of anticipating it to come down to the bottom of the range. Who knows? Uh, but I'm I'm okay either way. So that's the other thing I wanted to mention here is when we look at these two charts, well, we can see that, you know, this, this is the Bitcoin range. It broke up above. And all we're seeing in either, I guess what I'm trying to say is they're living different lives now. Before they were so closely correlated and they still do have correlation, of course, but they're starting to diverge. And is this temporary because of the having? Is this just the beginnings of them being completely on their own? I don't know, but they are quite, quite different. And I think Richard pointed out too that um, uh, the, 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 yeah, the, the vol spread is, is a bit different because uh, you know, Bitcoin's got a bit more volatility. Now, on that last spike up that happened a few days back, uh, vols did spike up and they did stick. You know, they came off a little bit, but they did stick. Bitcoin is a bit stickier than Ethereum. Now, looking uh, at, so now that we've looked at that chart, as you recall, last week, after the end of the call, the consensus was to put on an iron condor. So I did. I built it in two stages. We had that spike up. I sold some calls up there, but lightly because I expected or I was um, prepared for it to keep going and I wanted to scale into it. Didn't want to put it all in at once, but it didn't happen. It pulled back that I put the put side on. So here's the poll. Uh, let me publish it right now. So we do have an iron condor. It's the 13th of October. I wanted to keep it short dated. So it was two weeks at that time. Now it's only seven days left to expiry. It's the 1400, 1500, 1800, and 1900. So the 14, 1500 is the put spread, and the 1800 is the call spread. Now, the short puts, when I looked this morning, they were showing around 10 or 13% profit on, on those. Uh, on the call side, though, we're about 70% profit. So, my question for you in the audience is what do you think with this? And I'll tell you what I think afterwards, but do you think we should just sit tight and wait? After all, it's only seven days to expire, right? We have a rapid, rapid decay in there. Or should we maybe close the call side? The call side's got the profit. We could just close it and walk away with that money, right? Nothing wrong with that. Or maybe roll those calls down. So we could roll them maybe from 1800 down to 1750 or 1700 might be cut, cut shaving it a bit close, but you know, anything's possible. We could do whatever we want. Uh, or just close the whole darn thing out now and walk away. We've got profit on both sides, not very much on the put side, but we could do that. So let me know your thoughts. Uh, and at the end of the call, we'll, we'll come back to that. Uh, so let me just go back quickly to the uh, slides here. Um, or actually, Richard, uh, why don't you share your screen first and just, just talk about what you got going on, then we'll come back to the slides and we'll get into <clears> the <throat> topic. Yeah, sure. I figured since I did my best, best UK accent, I figure you need to do your best <laughs> Canadian accent. I, I <laughs> oh. Uh... <laughs> Just say A after, right? Oh, I guess. Uh, that's right. I oh, had an oops. I <laughs> and just say you're sorry all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't really know much of any of the Canadian idioms. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go out and hunt a moose or something. I don't know. Yes, exactly. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, right. Uh, I haven't done a lot this week, actually. I've, um, as you know, in this home. I'm kind of just short calls. Uh, I'm actually short some futures as well against my Bitcoin. So I, I'm holding about two Bitcoins and I'm short about one Bitcoin in futures or perpetuals. I really should actually buy those perpetuals and sell the dated futures because there is a interest rate spread on those right now. Perpetuals are an average funding cost is about 3%. And the, and the average, the funding cost on the futures is about 5.2%, 5.3%. So I really should be playing the perpetuals against the futures, but I just can't, can't be bothered. Um, I, I need to write a program to, to, to do that for me. Um, I did have a short call expiring tomorrow, 28.250, and I didn't kind of like it. It was you know, a few basis points in profit, and I thought, just take, you know what, just take it off the table. And I sold it. We sold it out, at, um, I think, on the 20th of October, I think, I sold something there. Um, and what I'm seeing in terms of implied vols, this is the 27th, I think we're seeing. I did sell a couple of puts, just, just, I mean, really small, like 0.1 in November and 
uh, 0.5 in October. I um, don't like selling naked puts, but I was looking for some vol somewhere, and there's a bit of down, downside skew, not much. It's a funny market because the, the, the market's showing a bit of feeling like it's starting to show, to show strength in the spot market, as you say. I wouldn't say strength, but, you know, at least at least resilience to going down. And um, at the same time, implied vols are being crushed as ever this year. Um, so we're at 30% vol of the money uh, in the one month, uh, which is kind of almost enough to sell if you're not going to hedge every day. Uh, on my systematic book, I'm not adding any risk at all right now. I just feel well, that leads on to the topic of this talk. Um, and the skew, the upside skew isn't, isn't really, well, it's, it's negative. So the upside skew is almost cancelling out the smile. So there isn't really much value in selling anything on the upside either. So I'm just kind of letting it all decay a bit and just uh, see what happens, I think. Um, if I were to do anything clever, I'm, what I might do right now is sell ETH volatility and buy Bitcoin volatility as a kind of a correlation spread, vol spread between the two um, markets. So sell ETH and buy Bitcoin? Yeah, the, the vol, right? Um, not, not, the, not the underlying. So I might, for example, sell a strangle on ETH and buy a strangle on Bitcoin, for example. Mm. Um, because normally the, there's a, normally about a five vol spread between the, the, the implied vol of ETH versus Bitcoin. I mean, five-ish. And right now it spreads down to about two and a half. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's kind of tempting to start looking in, in that direction for inspiration. Um, if, we, if we start to see implied vols on Bitcoin get down to about 28 at the money or lower, I will start systematically buying back all my short short positions. And I'm very happy to, to actually let the, let the book get flat between now and the end of October um, mm. with a view to, look, you know, we're just wait, waiting on some kind of event to spike some vols in there. Because right now, one of those situations, I, I coined this phrase back early in the, in the year, um, I was talking to the Paradigm guys, it's too, it's too cheap, it's, it's too expensive to buy and it's too terrifying to sell. Mm. Kind of, kind of the, mm -hmm. you know, you kind of get that feeling. Um, so that's kind of why I, where I, where I am. Yeah, and I get what you're saying. I, I didn't really say it, but uh, I've been kind of feeling the last few times when I go in and I look for things to do, try and find ways to make money. I thought, you know what? I really wouldn't mind being flat. And I'm kind yeah. of looking at the expiries coming up. I'm like, okay, after the 6th and after the 13th, um, you know, I'll have some stuff on. Obviously, I've got the diagnosis of longer dated things, uh, but I'm actually quite happy to be flat um, right now. I, I, I just get that feeling, and I think that even in our chat, I think maybe Dom, yeah, Dom was just saying that, you know, he's, you know, his trend system where he was talking is starting to look strong, and I think we're all kind of feeling that it might be ready to start move up, and mm -hmm. maybe the best thing to do is just kind of sit on our hands and, and wait. It, it, and we do have some, I mean, I do have some positional things. I've got those longer dated uh, call options, those diagonals on on Bitcoin. So I'm I'm quite happy if if it goes up. But yeah, for for vol sellers, be, be careful. Yeah, I was going to say that I I kind of would sell calls into the rally if the skew was positive. But right now the skew is negative. The, the, there's a bit more volume puts than there is in calls, and I'm very happy to sell calls into a rally and hedge it because I I know I can win win by by climbing this smile. But at the moment. Just not enough of a, um, where are we, where's, where's the one month, the um, 27th of October. I mean, don't, don't, don't be fooled by this graph. Okay, yes, the 12,000 put is at 120 vol, but let's look at where the smile really is, right, between the 10 deltas. Actually, the, the smile is, uh, you can't really tell. Mm. It's uh, slightly skewed towards the puts, uh, four, mm. four to three, yeah. And, I'm I'm happy to sell, I'm happy to sell calls all day long if if the skew is positive because um, I, I know mm -hmm. I can I can out hedge the smile but um, at the moment it just doesn't feel worth it you know but, I mean yes I'll make money but I, it, it not enough to make it worthwhile losing sleep over it yeah no because if you do get a big uh, you know multi <clears throat> multi uh, um, um, standard deviation event it could hurt so let's... And, it's, and it's very embarrassing to have sold vol at say 35 and then see it's currently now, now at 55 and have to explain that to yourself or worse somebody else <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, like, like dom just said it not enough meat on the bone so there you go yeah nice, fair nice right analogy. yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Which I think is is, is another segue into our our uh, topic today. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Let me just um, here. Let me cancel this and. Should I stop sharing? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yep. Okay. So basically today. Um, who want to talk about understanding probability and become a better options trader. And this is, you know, I mean, we could sit down and have coffee or beer or whatever we want to do and chat about this for hours, really. And this is the things that we, we sort of do talk about. Um, but it's going to be nice to talk about this with our members a little bit because, uh, you know, there's a lot of parallels between other activities in life and, and trading hmm. uh, and a lot of false uh, assumptions as well but probability is a huge component and when we're talking about delta you know one of the four primary components of delta that we're using is, is a probability indicator if you've got a, yeah. a 30 delta call well if you've bought that you've got a 30 percent chance of expiring in the money or the market thinks that at the time Perfect. if you've sold it you've got a 70 percent chance of expiring uh, 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 it, uh, uh out of the money so we're using delta as a probability all the time so so probability is nothing really new um, an option choice, but it's actually very, very, very important. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll just, uh, we don't need that on. Anyway. I would have a slide, but yeah, okay. So I was, I was kind of expecting there to be some funky um, uh, graphics <laughs> here, but it's, it's just, it's just a little me. So um, uh, I wasn't allowed to say this for the for the title of the of the episode, but um, I, I think I can say it here. So there's a there's a big difference um, between gambling and Betting. Is that fair? Um, yeah. uh, there are people who make bets on a professional basis, and I, including on horse races and uh, uh, and card games. And those people who do it professionally are are not gambling. They're not because gambling is you know make a bet and then pray to whatever icon you've got that um, that you'll be really good if your number comes in. Um, or you just bet with the assumption that you're going to statistically bleed money all, all night long. Um, but a professional gambler, um, and it's the wrong term really, but that's the term we use. Professional gambler is somebody who understands probability very well. And even though they are operating within a game that is rigged towards the house, or uh, in the case of horse racing, rigged towards the overround of the, the bookies, um, and uh, they will make money consistently. And it's because they, uh, understand probability and also understand the indicators of pro probability in the particular game on which they're making bets. And we can be fairly, you know, let's not beat around the bush too much. We are trading options in a cash settled market. That's the very definition of a, of a bet. It just happens that the payoff curve is not, is not binary. Um, and we owe it to ourselves then to um, make those bets in, in an informed way. Um, we can think of the market makers as the house. Um, they're building in an edge by charging a bid and ask spread on the vol surfaces or the prices that they're coming up with. Um, and we are paying those spreads on the whole. Um, and we're also paying a small fee to the house to, the, to Deribit for the privilege of trading on their platform. And, you know, we, we can't argue about that too much. If we weren't paying them, we'd be trading in TradFi, and we'd be paying a broker for his time and effort in um, spending your money in the club uh, or the golf course. So, um, and that's the game we're in, right? So we accept the, the, that there are, we, we come to this table and we don't have the edge because we are retail. Um, and actually, by, by retail, I, might, I even mean a hedge fund still comes to the table as a, uh, you know, buy side. So he's paying those spreads. So how do we um, skew the odds in our favor? We do have in our favor, much like blackjack, um, and I, I, I don't mean to, you know, flippantly claim that trading options is just like black, blackjack, but it's actually just like blackjack um, if you're playing it properly. Which is that on if you're playing blackjack um, and being fair to yourself, and you evade detection by the house, you will limit your bet size when the odds are against you, or even not play at all. And when the odds are in your favor, you will increase your bet size. Um, and uh, this is the, the very essence of card counting. And for anyone, I'm sure you all know what card counting is, but just in case anyone's watching who doesn't, um, card counting is the art of watching which cards get turned up in the from the deck 
um, and you um, you decrease the count when you see a 10 or a picture card and you increase the count when you see a, a low card, I think it's two, three or five or something like that. Um, and you're looking for the ratio of low cards to high cards. And why is that important? Well, because when there are lots of high, high cards in the deck, the, the chances are good that a dealer will deal himself a 10. And uh, dealers hate being dealt 10s because about half the cards in the deck are 10s, right? So, um, because if the whole dealer's holding a um, six or lower and he deals himself a 10, he has to take another card. And there's a 50% chance that that's a 10 as well, and then he's bust. Um, and if he deals himself a seven, he must take a 10, which gets him a, he's going to take a 10, which gives him a 17, and that's the card you're going to be, and, and so on, right? So, um, uh, so it's similarly to the casino where the where the pit bosses aren't watching. We ha we have the same advantage. We can sit and notionally, in quotes, count cards, and we, and we can definitely choose when we do and when we don't bet. I.e., when we take positions off and when we put positions on. So, and I'm using a huge metaphor here of card counting versus options market. What it what is it in the options market that is the card count? Well, for me, and I suspect the majority of us we largely trade volatility. And what we're really trading is the um, probability of getting in the money on a, uh, whether you're short or long, you either want to be or don't want to be, uh, to simplify. Um, and uh, the probability of that is very much dependent on the actual realized volatility of the market. And there are two volatilities, but I'm sure we're both we're all, we're all aware there's the realized volatility of actually what is the standard deviation of the average within the, the market squared and um, the implied volatility, which is what prices are in the options, what volatility are they, impri are they implying? And at the moment, we see that implied volatility, uh, I think I'll have to screen share, might be slightly more interesting than here, we're trading on share. Yeah. So, uh, Deribit has this very kind of handy little uh, chart. You can look at the historical volatility. So this is the um, annualized volatility, but taken daily for the past 15 days. So we're currently trading. Um, it's like a weighted, is it, what is it weighted? I forget now. Um, um, but the, the current realized volatility is more or less exactly 30%. Um, and the current um, options vol, uh, the devol index is currently thirty-seven. And if I go and look at the at the one money one month right now, um, I think we'll see that it's uh, thirty. Okay. So what's it, what's this telling me? Well. The blended devol is is seven vols above the um, act, uh, the, 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 real, the realized vol, but actually right now the at the money one month um, calls and puts are pretty much trading at exact exactly the the, the the implied vol, which exactly matches the market. Which kind of means if you if you buy or sell that option, um, let's assume that the realized vol is going to stay the same. That's at thirty or thereabouts. You're basically making a fifty fifty punt. Win or not, that's that's the long short. Um, and by winning, I mean you know if you buy the call, then the call gets deeper in the money than you paid for, it. and if you sell the call, it doesn't get any deeper than you paid for it, and so on. Um, so that feels to me like a total gamble. That means uh, that's the same as just walking into the casino with my eyes shut and placing a bet uh, on the blackjack table. Um, uh, if I if I if I see Realized volatility go higher than this, um, but I, but the the at the money vol stays at thirty. Then actually that implies that I should probably buy the option. Uh, it's a pretty strong signal that I should buy the option. Um, now bear in mind that um, the realized volatility is a standard deviation and. The markets don't always operate within one standard deviation, and so we, we, there's always the probability that we'll get an extra, you know, uh, bump in in, in, the, in the spot. Um, but long and short of it, 
you can you can kind of say that on average, if you if you write a small position every day, a random strike, um, and you're doing it at similar vols to what's what's being realised or you know what's being seen in the market, then you are basically just gambling as whether you're going to to win or lose. Um, and that's kind of why I'm in the in the frame of mind right now of reducing my short positions. Um, I'm not rushing to reduce because we might get another couple of old sell-off, in which case I'll make an extra 500 bucks on this account. Um, and, I'm, and I'm not massively concerned about vols spiking, you know, in the next 48 hours either. Uh, I don't feel there's, there's much. We've got, well, we've got Friday tomorrow. There's no real announcements happening, and then we've got the weekend. I, I would imagine well, if this carries on, we'll get a vol crushing into the weekend, and I'll probably put some buy orders in on Saturday. To, to buy this back. But neither is there anything compelling me to say, you know what, I should be starting to up my bets at the table because there just isn't. Um, no, the reason I wrote this this um, half a Bitcoin <clears throat> of downside risk at 24,500 was, well, you know, that down there we're trading it, we're pricing at 42 volts. So we're, we're pricing in the possibility of a, of a, of a jump in the market and not, not you know, Bigger, bigger than one standard deviation move um, a day, and there is always that on the wings. Um, the, the wings are dangerous and get priced priced accordingly, uh, which is kind of why I trade I trade them um, because I find often it's easier to get a mispricing out there than it is at the money. Uh, but I think people tend to focus on very strongly on the twenty five delta to fifty delta range, and the wings often get bought as an afterthought. Um, to protect people, you know, so you know, our condor people buy by the wings and won't really count the price. So that provides an opportunity for people like me to go and hunt out there for mispricing. Um, uh, but I'm, what, I'm, what I'm betting betting by saying by writing that that put is, you know, I bet that there won't be a two sigma move in the next three weeks. Um, or definitely, or definitely not a three sigma, but I'm not betting. I'm not making a strong bet. You know, I, I, I'm like short. I don't know, five or more bitcoins of calls, and I'm short half a bitcoin of puts because I because I just I'm weighing up my knowledge of the market. You know, we've had a, a push up. It's not that strong. We're not in the halving season yet. Uh, you know, um, I'm kind of okay being short calls. Um, uh, even at 20 delta, I'm okay. Um, but puts, you know, treat with care. Um, but if I, but if I saw, if we had a, uh, you know, another thousand point dollar up move, um, and the, the vols skew up to towards the upside, and we started seeing 50 vols on the on the calls again, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I'm happy, happy to get in there because I, and that's when I'd start increasing my bets. Um, and if we had a push down to 25k and scared everybody off, then and I saw the balls jump to sort of 60 or 70 on the downside. Yeah, I mean I'm willing to take to take, to take that bet because I'm you know we've probably seen maybe a 40 vol in the market realised and I'm pricing at 60. I'm I, I'm okay with that. Um, so uh, and this this principle applies whether you're going long or short vol. Um, what you're looking for is the the spread between the realised and the, or what you think is going to be the realized and the the, uh, the implied. Um, that's pretty much the basis of value. Um, now this of course implies that you are writing positions and then delta hedging should be zero or you are writing you know, um, every day. And in fact, I do both delta hedge and I write a little bit of risk every day to try and capture the sort of average of the of the move and not get too pinned to one strike, which is why you'll see I've got you know options I'm sure all kinds of strikes uh, here. So that's that's the, the kind of um, the, the basis of this. Uh, the, the, so the long story short, I when when the vol spread between implied and realized gets crushed, I start taking money off the table, and when the when the um, the spread widens. Um, that's where I, I get keen to start adding adding more risk. So I'm, you'll see me as one of the first people to start going against the trend and selling calls into rallies and selling puts into into uh, sell offs because that's when you get max fear. Uh, actually, a bit different on rallies. At rallies, you tend to get max fear just before the blow off when everyone has to has to short cover, um, and that's a great time to go piling in. If you see that you know spike in vol, 
um, and, and normally it's a skew that involves by on the act monies. Uh, that's the that's the signal for me to go piling in because uh, I know now that the cat's in my favour. Um, yeah, so that's kind of that's kind of where I'm going with this. Anyway, yeah, I think that I, I think that's very wise, and I, I think too many people just always do sort of the same bet all the time, and I say bet by trading the same size all the time. They're always mm. risking 10% or 1% of their count or, you know, whatever their system happens to be, uh, or they always have their margin at a certain amount. Uh, when really, you know, we like the, the gambling analogy, it's, it's kind of wise to back off sometimes and uh, sometimes go harder. And uh, that's uh, ends up affecting your bottom line. And of course, there's always going to be regrets. There's always be, Oh, geez, I should have went in bigger. Or, oh, why didn't I reduce the size? Yes, that happens. But we need to follow a system. You need to trust your gut, and you need to just look at the data. And I think that uh, when things don't seem favorable, well, just just don't don't be there. And I've said before, the gift of being flat. Sometimes it's nice just not have anything. Let mm. the market go crazy, and because it's nothing worse than a world. We've all been there where we regretted having a a, a position. So, uh, just want to quickly mention too. Uh, we, we always have a seven day free trial. Uh, go over to uh, roguetrader.academy and uh, sign up for any of our plans for a seven-day free trial. Of course, silver and above. You get the interactive real-time chat with us, chat with us every day, and uh, jump on our calls with us uh, every Monday, as well as joining us here on Darabit Live. Um, so any questions, please put them into the Q&A. We do have a question from, from uh, a, a couple of questions here. Uh, we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, just before... I finish. Uh, let me just go to the poll. Now, this poll is regard. Oh, you're still sharing your, your screen, by the way, Richard. Uh, I did that in response to something that, um, oh. that one of the guys said. This was, uh, oh. Oh, it was, I think I moved to the question thing, but I think you might believe it. Um, uh, let's see oh, there, there we go. It's in the chat. Uh, in response to something Alex mentioned. <clears throat> so, uh, oh, okay. Well, reviewed it in terms of terms, yeah, instead of strikes. So, I was just going to say that I, I this is, um, a Jupyter notebook um, using the analytics by Immersive Finance, uh, who are a great friends of mine and also the incredibly gifted um, uh, uh, organization. Um, so uh, you can see the top line of that little table in, in my window, which is uh, row zero, one month. And uh, this was taken from earlier today, but um, you can see that this is how I express volatilities. Uh, this is how I see a vol surface. So I'm looking at the one month expiry, the uh, 30 day now, so the at money forward was 32.61%. And then the skew is the RR bit. So it's the risk, what we call the risk reversal. So what's the difference between the volatility of the calls for a given delta and the volatilities of the puts for a given delta? And by convention, we use 25 delta risk reversals. That was showing half a percent uh, negative skew. So the the puts were half a percent more expensive than the calls in terms of vol. And the 10 RR, that's 10 risk reversal was um, the calls uh, two and a half percent, two and a half vols uh, lower than the puts. So, uh, and this, this, this is how actually I, I see the world. Um, so when I'm talking about positive and negative skew, you can see here out here at nine months whether, whether halving is gonna happen. Um, mm -hmm. Both the fly, the, the butterfly, the 10 fly is the butterfly. So the 10 delta butterfly, which is the difference between the 10 delta puts and calls, vols, and the at the monies, that's 13.7%. Plus the calls are 13.5% above the puts. So that, mean, that means that you, you take half the reversal, add it to the, the fly, and that means that the nine month call volatility is trading 20 percent above the amount of money volatility. So there's a strong, strong uh, view of um, upside there. And actually that's, that. I think that's probably slightly overblown, which is why I I did my trade of the decade a few weeks ago of buying mm -hmm. out the monies and selling, selling me out of the monies. Uh, yeah, just, so I just wanted to cover that, sorry. All right, so everyone that should be clear as mud, right? <laughs> All right. I'll, I'll just quickly jump back to the poll. We'll, we'll take a couple of questions. We've already run over our, our time limit, um, so yes. I'm going to be quick here. So, regarding our iron condor we put off that it uh, put on, which which expires uh, on uh, next Friday on the 13th, 
42% uh, of you, and you can see the results, say sit tight and wait. That's actually my convention too. I'm going to sit. With these shorter term things, I do that a lot. Uh, longer terms, I, I take them off earlier. Um, then 38% of you said, hey, let's close the call side. Hey, we're up 70-something percent. You know, maybe we should just close it. That's good, and I like to do that. But if, it, if the market starts to go down and press the put side even more, we regret closing the call side. We thought, oh, would have missed this, squeak that extra money out of there and add some more protection on the downside. But I don't think there's anything wrong with doing either of those things, to be perfectly honest. I always break uh, current, uh, you know, flies and condors all the time, uh, or I'll, I'll break their wing or I'll, 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 I'll change the strikes, uh, do all kinds of things. Um, you know, there's no rule we have to do anything in particular. But uh, I like that. So everybody says sit and wait. So you know what? I'm going to sit and wait. So next Thursday will be the day before expiry. I'm not sure I'll have it. I might have to manage that position. But if we're clear on each side, I'll let it expire. If we're not clear, um, I might take action. But uh, so far, the plan will be sit tight and wait. Okay. Uh, a question here from Stanislav. We can just go through a couple of questions and that's it. Uh, so Stanislav says, earlier I sold some out-of-the-money calls with auto DH, then began a strong movement in ETH. The price didn't reach my calls, about one to two strikes. And bounced. I got large losses on DH. After two days expired, calls didn't recoup the losses at all. Is it worth to roll out on price movement, even if it's not at the money? Okay, so this is this is my, my bread and butter, um, to, to coin an English phrase. Uh, so auto DH means auto delta hedger, um, just for anyone who doesn't know. So, um, Stanley, you've, you've come across the, the, the bane of um, systematic uh, options books the, the world over. So when you're auto hedging, you you kind of hope that you are therefore hedging away all of the effects of spot moves and therefore only trading the volatility. But of course, the auto hedger um, does incur losses because it's, it cannot hedge the curve perfectly as we move. Um, and uh, also, you have to delta hedge according to the correct volatility surface. Um, if you're just using the volatility surface that comes from the market, what you might find is that as the um, skew rises, um, if, if, for example, now the, the skew is negative and you're short calls, your auto hedger, uh, and we get a move up, your auto hedger actually isn't going to buy enough um, delta to, to hedge nicely. And if after a while of that, um, plus, of course, you're, you're you're making small hedging errors all the way up because you're hedging periodically rather than continuously and you're paying market fees if you really are going to hedge continuously. Um, and then you might find that the, the as the market goes up, the skew goes positive and your delta hedger starts to hedge more aggressively because of, just because of the implied increased delta um, because of the skew and uh, then the market might reverse. So now you've not hedged high enough on the way up but the the skew's reversed and your and the market goes down, and your delta hedges are now over hedging on the wrong side, getting and, and causing your losses in both directions. So it's an art to how to, how to tune your auto hedger, and uh, this is one of the reasons that I don't recommend anyone's auto hedger because because it's you know I can't I can't um, I can't vouch for anyone else other than what I do to, for myself, uh, and that's why I, I have a team who write my my software for me and we tune it continuously um, and so but long story short the problem occurs when you've sold volume cheap. Um, it's just selling volume auto hedging it is not a guarantee that you're going to make money because mm -hmm. uh, if the market is doing their jobs properly you won't um, you you still have to uh, look for the mispricings and that's why I trade the wings because I find that I get I get more mispricing opportunities out there I think you know, market makers are very, the market is, is extremely good at arbitraging away errors anywhere within 20, 25 dollars because that's what everyone trades. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, there's a life lesson, a cheap, a cheap life lesson for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, and, you know, just, just to, when you were showing your, your spreadsheet um, in the Delta, uh, I think uh, Alex came back and said what he meant is on Deribit, you can actually switch the smile view from, yes. Instead of looking at strikes over to, to, to Delta, but <clears throat> okay. Yes. Uh, what, time for one last question. We're way over time. Sorry, one. Uh, Paul asks question about hedging with futures. 
how do you calculate the needed size and does the cost not offset your options theta income? So long story short, if you want to hedge to zero delta, you compute the delta of your options. You um, add in any delta that comes from the, the inventory you hold, any of the Bitcoins in your account. And then you trade that many Bitcoins of options. And when you, when you, so our futures, I beg your pardon. So, and when you enter in the futures trading screen, you can either enter your, enter your amount either in dollars or in, in Bitcoins. Um, so that's the short answer. The second part, does the cost not offset your options theta income? Yes, it does. And if you're going to delta hedge continuously, as I do, you better sell your options for more than they're worth. And if you're going to delta hedge your long options positions continuously, you better buy them for, for less than they're worth. Mm -hmm. Hence, the that's my day job is looking for these mispricings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, if you and if you don't want to bother with looking for the mispricings, uh, you can do what I do on my home saving account, which is hedge occasionally when things get nasty, and trust the luck that um, the market's going to stay stay, stay in a range. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Which you should do in smaller size, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Okay, that's it for today. Uh, again, thanks everyone for joining us. Anyone who wants to uh, join us uh, day in, day out on our Telegram channel, head over to roguetrader.academy and sign up for a, a free trial of Silver Above, and you can have access to our real-time trade alerts and, and chat with us. Uh, and, hey, for all of you, uh, give me... And don't forget, don't, and, and the, the, gold, the gold account gives, gives you the ability to actually have one-on-ones on, one on with us. Yes, yes, we do. I didn't want to plug us too much. You know, I'm trying to be <laughs> humble here. Uh, but ch check that out. Uh, yeah, access to us, which which I think is fun because we love chatting with people and we love uh, helping people out, whether you're beginning or or you're uh, you know really sophisticated and looking for for new strategies. So that's it for this week. Uh, thanks for the advice on the iron condor. I'm going to let that cook uh, for a little while. We'll see if we can run it right into expiry next week, but we'll see. Bitcoin starting to show some strength, and so we'll see if we get a bit of a push up. Other than that, see you next week, everyone. <laughs>